I wanted to give a strictly geopolitical argument of why, how and why China will invade the United States and why they will be successful. So if you're new to this channel, you might not know that for 10 years or so, I have been predicting that China and Russia will invade the United States. And back then, it was a rare thing for anyone to believe that. I was ridiculed for that position. And then over time, more and more famous people started to come to that same conclusion. And now the number of people who agree with this includes high-ranking generals, former and current politicians, and so forth. But I wanted to share just a snapshot of some of the geopolitical reasons for why this will happen. The only question is when it's going to happen, and I guess precisely how, but I want to give you some ideas about this so that you can start to wrap your head around the reality of this because it's going to happen. So as an agenda here, what we're going to talk about is why China will inv invade the United States, how they're going to do it, and why they're going to be successful. At the very end of this, we're going to talk about what you should do about it. So let's start with item number one, why China will invade the United States. Many years ago, I read a book by Jared Diamond. I'm trying to think of which one it was. I think it's called Collapse. He's the guy that wrote Guns, Germs, and Steel. He got a lot of positive renown for that. And in preparation for this video, I actually went back and reread the chapter in question, but he's got a chapter in one of his books where he extensively talks about China. Now, this book is at least 10 years old, and I think it's actually probably is closer to 15 years old at this point. And what's amazing about this is he just lays out this Loctite case for why China has to come to a conflict with the United States. There's no other way to put it. And in short, the argument is the United States, the, the U.S., consumption of goods requires global resources. The standard of living in the United States is too high for the United States to provide its own resources to meet it. And it has been that way for a long time. And China's on the same path. And so one of those two things has to give because there aren't enough resources in the world to satisfy two countries that live the, the lifestyle of the United States. And the survival of the Chinese regime requires a constant increase in the standard of living of those people, or else they won't tolerate it. So he then goes into detail about how polluted China is, how they, they don't have any natural resources left. Their, their country is giving up some measurable percentage of its arable land every year to soil erosion and salination of the land which happens when you irrigate they have all kinds of very strange natural disasters they have sandstorms all the time which further erodes the the soil they have and destroys crops they have weird pests um, most of the worst diseases in the world have come out of china over the years whether it's most recently with covid of course that wasn't in the book but also plant diseases so the chinese um, there was a Chinese disease that killed all the elm trees, the, the Dutch elm trees uh, all over the United States. There's a chestnut disease and so forth. So um, these, these have been serious problems. Lots of invasive species coming out of there, like the Chinese carp. And so, of course, they've decimated the home country and they're in a lot of trouble. They can't produce nearly enough food for themselves. Now, China's been quietly for those in the, in the United States, but not if you're in these countries, quietly reaching its tentacles around places like the African continent where they're using deals, financial deals, to basically take as collateral huge segments of natural resources in, in these countries, these resource-rich countries, um, because China is very wise about how they deploy their capital. They're printing money just like the United States, but instead of spending it on really stupid things like we are, 
they're spending it on things that will set them up in a better position as the current system falls apart. So, in short, it's, it's going to happen because China and the United States cannot coexist. Under the non-negotiable constraints that each has. So neither one's going to back down, which means there has to be a conflict and one will lose. So now let's talk about how China is going to do this. Um, and this bleeds into why they'll be successful. You see, for some reason, Americans are, and, and this seems to be a first world problem in general, but we'll blame it on the Americans. We Americans are, are completely incapable of thinking about other cultures. We cannot adopt the thinking of other people. We project ourselves onto everyone. And this, this, you see this even within our own country when the folks making these decisions are completely hopeless at understanding how people at the bottom of society think and act. And so they make laws designed around how criminals would think and act if they were them. And we do this on an international scale, and it has just as catastrophic consequences, if not worse. So 10 years ago, when I started saying China was going to invade the United States, the people that thought that I was crazy, which was pretty much everyone who heard it, They'd say things like, China can't invade the United States because, and then they'd give some reason that indicated that they assumed that China would only ever invade the U.S. in the same way the U.S. would invade China. And how is that? That's this George W. Bush shock and awe military doctrine. We only fight wars one way, and because of that, we tend to lose them in modern times. Because the, the way that we do it is extraordinarily expensive. In people, in money, in materiel, it's it's very expensive. Okay. So look at how we react to these balloons floating over the country that China is deploying. Uh, it's a wonderful case in point. Or look how we're responding to the Houthi um, attacks on the ships in the Middle East. They're sending up drones that cost maybe a thousand dollars, and we're responding with things that that cost orders of missiles that cost orders of magnitude more than that. You know, they're launching these these dollar store attacks, inflicting significant casualties, and we have to deploy billion dollar ships to counterattack, and it's still not all that effective. And so there's a, there's a huge mismatch because almost everything we do in this country, militarily, it, it, it's optimized on enriching the military-industrial complex instead of actually winning. And that's a very different motive. And so countries much smaller than ours have been able to develop exceptionally good military technology, effective military tactics, where our approaches are locked into a time that ended at least 30 years ago. So China, one of the, the main re ways that we have failed to properly anticipate China, even though they've very plainly said what their intentions are since at least the 90s, when two senior ranking Chinese officials published a textbook on basically total warfare. So unrestrained warfare. And what's the difference between unrestrained and traditional war? There are no bounds on unrestrained warfare. We can only think in terms of shock and awe. We're, we talk about going to war. You've got like a 10-month leading time where we're putting all these, and I've been involved in things like this when I was in the military. You pack up all the gear. You get it ready to ship by rail. They ship it on trains to whatever port they put it on ships they send it out across the sea it gets in country people have to be there to put it to whatever closer base it's getting to and you bring it as close to the battlefield as you can you got to get people out there it takes it takes forever to organize this 
okay that's the way we fight war and then we get over there and it's this long drawn out thing and we have to build these huge bases with pizza huts in the cafeterias and that's not the way the Chinese and also the Russians do business so how do the Chinese fight wars well they're not new ideas it's super old ideas and philosophy you know the art of war very old book but the Chinese way is patience the Chinese way is for victory they are not in a hurry they do not need to be flashy the Chinese approach is to do the greatest damage they can to the United States without anyone realizing what they're doing or even if they realize it's coming from them they do it so slowly that they use the Overton window to their advantage so that people get used to it like a like a frog in a pot of water that's brought to a boil it starts at room temperature and it's just slowly brought up to temperature so the frog doesn't jump and we're the frog and this has been going on for for decades it's been going on it's it's this mix of things that that no normal person realizes how much China's clandestine war which already started it's already ongoing how much of that is touching their everyday life but let me help you get acquainted with this it's they're just what they're trying to do is reduce our ability to fight that's their goal to get us to destroy ourselves so those are two goals get us to destroy ourselves reduce our ability to fight everything from the pharmaceuticals you use and how much of them you use to where you buy stuff and, and what you buy you know everything in Walmart's made in China there's no limit to how much this touches in your life and you didn't even notice and it, it, it's already at a critical level they want it to be as involved as it can be while still remaining covert or at least as integrated in your daily life as it can be so that you won't make a fuss because you're hooked on it okay so let's just talk about some of these things manufacturing personnel resources and willpower or will to fight okay the peace in our streets level of crime our ability to get jobs to keep jobs how much those jobs pay mental health you've got everything from TikTok. so so let's just walk through what's the what's the thing and what's its purpose TikTok, that's a Chinese tool what's its purpose to destabilize young people why young people are soldiers they're the ones that would get drafted in the event of war you can look up operational readiness for the military it's the lowest it's been in a very long time a huge percent of the military aged youth in the United States is disqualified from service because they're either crazy or they're fat and that's that's even before you know they're not going through basic training a whole bunch of them would drop out because it'd be the hardest thing they've ever done and they'd be completely overwhelmed even though speaking from experience it's a piece of cake so that's there there you go with TikTok, right did you know that the chinese are partial sources of funding for black lives matter the chinese government supports that why do you think the chinese government would want to support black lives matter They want to destabilize the country. Race wars are an easy way to get us to destroy ourselves. Illegal immigration. Why do you think the Chinese government would support over 10 million people coming into this country illegally? Well, for one, they're pumping their own soldiers into the country to prep things, probably to do things, and also to wait for commands. 
But how many of over 10 million are Chinese soldiers? Only a small fraction. But how small does it need to be? You really don't need that many people to completely destroy a first world country once they're in. And if they're trained to work by themselves, it's really not that hard. But the thing about the Chinese is that they're all about overwhelming force. And they're all about leveraging that without even firing a shot. They're very strategic and patient. So don't think when people say, oh, the Chinese are going to invade. Don't think in terms of, oh, tomorrow there's going to be this fleet of ships and this, all these aircraft carriers and jets and bombing campaigns. And that's not the way it's going to happen. By the time it gets to that, everything will have been done that can be done, no matter how long it takes, to soften things up so that that can happen as a minimal, minimal amount of that. We might see a preview with Taiwan, depending on how they do that. All right, so what else? What else? And this is just a smattering. We have no idea what percentage of our government leaders are bribed or blackmailed by the Chinese. We know, you know, there was that high profile Democrat guy. What was his name? So his girlfriend was a Chinese spy. She was really a prostitute and got all kinds of secrets off of him. He got off the hook somehow. He's still in Congress. Uh, I think Nancy Pelosi's driver Chinese spy, Mitch McConnell's wife. So all these people, I should say alleged, right? Alleged, 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 alleged Chinese spies. They're very close to China. And these are just the ones we know about, but it's happening in broad daylight and no one cares. Why on earth would now former Speaker of the House have a Chinese national as a car driver? That doesn't sound like a good idea. So not too long ago, a story broke where Taiwan's long serving, whatever their equivalent of the Secretary of Defense is, very high ranking military person was busted for being a Chinese spy. And it turns out he had been in that role for a very long time during his active service. And no one knew. So what percentage of our government is compromised? The, the recently departed um, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Miley, he had some super suspicious, spe, if I can even say it, suspicious behavior in terms of his admitted back-channel communications with his Chinese counterpart, which under strict interpretation of the law was treason, but he got away with it. He was celebrated for it. So these are just the things that we know about. But even if China came in here with the guns blazing, shock and awe, that we just can't seem to think of anything but that, even if they did that, which they're not going to, an open question is how much of our government would run a smokescreen for them and, and somehow say that that's necessary or whatever else. And that probably goes outside the bounds of what you're able to seriously consider as plausible. But there's a whole host of things that once it gets that far, China could do to play the, the ruse of we're here to help. And remember that line when the time comes, because they won't be here to help. They'll be here to finish the job. So imagine, for example, they've been floating all these, these balloons over the United States. And I just saw this week there was another one. I think it's still over the United States. And we've had this terribly lackluster response to this. The fact of the matter is that you could very easily mount an EMP to one of these devices, float it over the U.S. and set it off. You could set off a cluster of them if you'd like. So no one would know 
how it happened, right? We don't always detect these things until they've already been over the U.S. for a while, but we're also used to them now. The, the precedent has been established that we are not going to do anything about it. The, the first one, I believe they let it float all the way across the U.S. for days until finally they shot it off of the East Coast of the U.S. It had gone that far. And so if we're in this such a passive mode, they're not even doing anything about the one over us right now because they say it's not a threat because it's only about two feet cube. So you could imagine that happening. And then if something like that did happen, then our government, whatever communications ability remained, which would probably be very little, even if just amongst themselves with some kind of emergency response, they could say, well, we need international assistance, right? And then here come the Chinese. That's a very plausible situation. And that's another thing people don't understand. There's a whole list of things that could be done by a nation like China to a nation like ours where no one would know where it came from. This isn't 1983 where ICBMs would be launched out of Russia and our detection systems would know and we'd have time to respond before everything got hit. There are so many things that have plausible deniability. For example, a cyber attack on the power grid. There are a lot of people, relatively speaking, there are multiple entities who could do something like that. And it's not a guarantee that we'd have any idea who did it. It's not an ICBM where you know where it's launching from. Especially if instead of a, a cyber attack on the grid, if it was a personnel attack on the grid. So I saw recently that at least 20,000 Chinese have come in illegally during Biden's term over the southern border. They're also coming in. There are a lot of Chinese people coming in from the northern border where we really don't have any infrastructure to stop that. Well, let's just suppose that 10% of them were actually Chinese special forces. They could really do a lot of harm without anyone knowing who was doing it especially if somehow they coordinated to do it all at the same time and do something like bring down the grid. But there are smaller things that can be done over time without the big drop, we'll call it. And those things are already happening. Now, how many of these you could chalk up to coincidence and maybe something else is causing them? I don't know. But you've got trains derailing. You've got food plants blowing up left and right. You've got all these things are happening where it just seems like a lot of bad things happening all at once. And magically, no one ever gets caught for any of this stuff. It's always just an accident, right? So how much of this can happen? And this is another thing where our limited thinking really harms our ability to anticipate the risk. We think in terms of really big actions, in really big reactions. We don't understand death by a thousand paper cuts. There are a lot of food plants, probably fewer than you expect, but there are a lot. And so what's one or 10 or even 20 mysteriously blowing up? But it has an effect. And the name of the game is to stay under the radar, but in aggregate cause serious damage. And that's what's happening. Let me give you one that you may not know about. So we all know the housing market is on steroids right now. The, the cost of living is going through the roof. And you are probably fully capable of listing off how extensive a problem that is and why it's a problem, right? But do you know why it's happening? Well, it's a complex situation. There's a lot of pieces to it. There's inflation. There's that counties keep increasing the requirements to comply with building codes and it costs more and more to build a house. All sorts of things, right? Regulations, inflation. There's the fact that boomers aren't downsizing like everyone as quickly as everyone thought they would and that has to do with interest rates. And then you've got tons of illegal aliens coming over the border and so there's not enough houses and all this stuff, right? What you probably didn't know is that 
the Chinese are buying tons of houses. And disproportionately, they're buying them in California. Now, any of you who live in a place, and there are many of them, to which Californians are flocking, because people don't sell their house in California to move to Philadelphia. They don't sell their house in California to move to Baltimore. They sell their house in California and move to Montana or Texas or Utah. And unfortunately, there's a, there's a, a small set of states that are having to deal with the problem of Californians moving in. And what is the problem? It, de it destabilizes local politics big time. It creates the need to build a lot more public schools, which increases property taxes out the wazoo. It, it uh, really skyrockets the cost of housing because those people are coming in from a different market. They have tons of cash and they'll pay any price. And so even if, if the inventories are low, which they are because interest rates are high, so people can't sell their house and move into another one, because they take a huge bath on the interest rate differential. Well, the Californians will pay any price and they'll still have cash sitting in their pockets. So here's the question. If you're in California and you want to sell your house, who's buying it? Because everyone's leaving. No one's going to California. Everyone's leaving. Is some illegal walking across the border and paying over a million dollars cash for your house? I don't think so. So who is? The Chinese. Over one third of home purchases in California in the last year were from Chinese. I, I mean, Chinese nationals or businesses. So I'm not saying Chinese Americans, I'm saying Chinese Chinese. So what effect do you think that has? Well, it keeps the home prices high. A lot of these houses remain vacant. These people aren't even moving in. So tell me this, I know China is a huge country with a lot of people, but how do so many Chinese people have the ability to drop over a million dollars in cash? Last time I checked, the exchange rate isn't that great. How do they have so many people with so much money? Now, some of them are no doubt private citizens just trying to get a good investment going, but not all of them. And who knows what kind of programs they have to subsidize this. Where just, again, on the sly, they're just like, hey, if you want to do this, we'll help you. Who knows? Who knows how that works? But what we do know is that they're jacking up the house price in California. And then those people that sell, they're moving to other states to jack up the price there. Now, why would you want this to happen if you were the Chinese government? Because bad things happen when people can't afford to live anywhere. And not just homelessness. That's sort of on the tail end of it. Everything gets worse, right? It's death by a thousand paper cuts. And none of it is directly traceable. Now let's talk about fentanyl. This, I think, has been their most successful play. So where is the illegal fentanyl created? It's manufactured in China. They know this. You can do... Uh, mass spec analysis on chemicals and find out through the isotope signatures where they're from. The government knows that the illegal fentanyl is coming from China and it's coming across the borders, but it's even just getting mailed internationally. That's how fragile our system is. That that's, it's okay, it just comes right through. So how disastrous has the overdose problem been in the United States? Even so, at this point, I think everybody knows someone who has died from an overdose. Maybe they weren't super close to you, but in many cases, in many cases, they were, and it's very sad. It's a serious problem, and it shows no sign of stopping. It's actually increasing exponentially. So, for all intents, it's it's going to get much worse. But do you know quantitatively how bad it's been? Well, I'll tell you. The United States was involved in World War II for four years. 
Did you know that in the last four years, more Americans have died from overdose than died in World War II? Think about that. Think about that. And that number, of course, dwarfed the ones that died in Vietnam. More Americans die per year from overdosing on drugs than died throughout the whole Vietnam War. Think about that. And no one seems to care at all. We've, that's the frog in the pot. People are so used to this that the only people that talk about it are those who have lost someone. And they're just talking about the loss, not really the problem. So China is successfully killing more people per year than the Vietnamese did throughout the whole Vietnam War. And we have not declared war on China. We're not doing anything about it. They have already killed more Americans than the Germans did in World War II. Just through that. And no one cares. Now, it's saying all that. I also have to say, because I am a preacher, I don't think that this is some magical problem that exists on its own. People have free choice, and we're not discussing that side of the issue. I'm just trying to draw attention to how big of a problem this is, and that it's exactly what China wants. By the way, the kinds of people who die on overdoses of drugs, that's also a targeted demographic. I mean, there's only so much you can do in a lot of ways making dirt trees Dirt cheap, highly powerful drugs, very easy to overdose drugs. It's a lot like floating balloons over a continent. You can't control the wind, but you can launch as many balloons as you want, and in aggregate, they'll do what you want. Disproportionately, overdose deaths are among young people, exactly the people that would be putting on uniforms and fighting, right? It's also working class people who are exactly the folks who work in manufacturing. If you know anyone in manufacturing, what they'll tell you is we can't find enough people to fill these jobs because they can't pass drug tests. And you remember one of the four things I, I listed are how does manufacturing affect our military readiness? Well, pre-war, it's certainly an economic component, right? But during a war, someone has to make the vehicles and the tanks and the, the armaments, the bullets, the missiles, the planes. And we don't have the manufacturing base that we did post-World War II or pre. But at that time, where has it all gone? To China. <laughs> to China. We've outsourced our ability to fight against our enemy to our enemy. We've done the same with pharmaceuticals. Some terribly high percentage of the, the process for every pharmaceutical product comes out of China. It's if, if during COVID, for example, the reason there are drug shortages is that the pharmaceutical companies weren't getting the ingredients from China. Because that was all shut down, obviously. Some other things that China's doing that you might not have heard about are these marijuana plantations. So when the, when the Chinese illegals come into the country, they know where they're going for the most part. There are plantations, complete operations, of illegal marijuana growing, for instance, set up all across the country. There, there are uh, over a thousand of these. They're all over the place. And so these folks come in and they get to work and they, they make marijuana and they sell it. And so that's a double whammy because not only do we have a group of people who are here illegally, they're also working without paying taxes. They're also making drugs illegally and then selling those. And so you're getting 
a stack of benefits that makes the United States worse off. And from time to time they're getting arrested, but like I said, the number of these plantations just keeps increasing. So whatever they're doing, they're not successfully curtailing that in any significant way. And it just goes on and on and on. So <laughs> it's actually the easiest thing in the world to prove that we're going to go to war with China because China's already at war with us. It's easy to prove that China's going to invade because they already have. And they're operating with impunity. No one's doing anything about this. It's just like the balloons. We know they come from China. Instead of confronting them on this, you know, if we even talk about it, their ambassador and all of these other Chinese officials are basically saying, how dare you? They understand that in the United States, it's not what you do that matters. It's how people feel about it. And so they come at us with, you're hurting our feelings, and we don't do anything about it. So they do more of it. Why would they stop? Now, in saying all that, it, it might give you a false sliver of hope because you might think that maybe something can be done to stop all this. There's nothing that can be done. It's going to happen. One of the reasons it's not going to stop is because at the end of the day, when you're dealing with an enemy, it's going to come to blows. If neither party backs down, it's going to come to blows. The Chinese will not back down. Their national survival requires them to take us out, and the national culture does not allow them to turn away from a challenge. It's very important to them. So it's not going to happen. Um, I, I omitted a few things that I should have brought up, which is, I'll just refer, refer you to this, the percentage of students, especially graduate students, in U.S. universities that are Chinese nationals, there's a whole host of universities that wouldn't be in business without the tuition dollars that come from China. Again, they're printing money and using it wisely, like to send a whole bunch of their students to get a first-rate first education in STEM in the United States. And then either to take jobs here in industry through which there's a massive theft of industrial secrets back to China. And that's been going on for a very long time or going back to China with all of that knowledge and experience to obviously produce and innovate there. And there are people all over the place, whether in university faculties or key industries who are Chinese nationals, and they may or may not be spies. And I'm not saying everyone who, obviously, I'm not saying everyone who's a Chinese national is therefore a spy. But their culture works very different to ours. And loyalty to the party above all else is very highly regarded. And it's enforced. They have police departments on U.S. soil operating illegally, and they shake down Chinese people that aren't towing the line. So they have a whole host of things they can do that a lot of them they're already doing, but there are big guns that they haven't brought out yet. So the intentionality of COVID is up for debate, but every first world nation, including ours, has the capability right now, they have an arsenal of biological weapons that they could deploy anywhere if they wanted to. Now, an open question is whether they have the, the antidote or vaccine or whatever the countermeasure is. If they have an effective countermeasure is an open question. But what COVID proved, just like these balloons that they're floating over, is that if it had come out of China and if it were intentional, no one's going to do anything about it. All you need to do is have some sort of videos made up that show that people are suffering from whatever there too. And maybe some videos of the government going over the top to take 
interventional measures like welding people inside their own apartments and walking through the streets with these big machines that are spraying bleach everywhere. And the international community will just assume that it was an accident, even if it did come from your country. I mean, that's pretty easy to organize in, in a country of over a billion people just recording a couple of videos. That's pretty easy. There are other things, too. Uh, the Russians, for example, have advertised the fact that they have an autonomous torpedo that can guide itself basically around the entire world and then set off a nuke underwater. And we wouldn't be, no one would be able to detect whether this was a naturally occurring tsunami from some sort of earthquake or a nuclear blast. And so if you want to soften up a target, so, you know, I had a conversation recently with friends of mine and they said, oh, if, if China were ever to invade Taiwan, first they would do something like set off an EMP or whatever to send a message to the United States not to get involved. I said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. If anyone did anything like that, that was so overt, there would have to be a response from the United States. I mean, at least a volley of cruise missiles. But if you get to the level of EMP, that's a full response that you're going to get. If we could trace it, if we couldn't trace it, it wouldn't send any message at all. So what people would do, what an entity would do like China, is they do something not to send a message, but to weaken us. They'd set off some sort of a flare of effects in order to prevent us from having the capacity to respond, not the will. That, that's not going to happen. So something like a nuclear torpedo off the East Coast or West Coast, probably East, that would cause enough damage that we would not have any surplus capability to do anything about Taiwan, but it would still be plausible de deniability. If you launch some kind of all-out attack, obviously you're going to know where that came from, right? The other thing is that the more people who are involved, the higher the likelihood of a whistleblower. It's hard to have a secret attack that tons and tons of people have to be in on. It's one reason why D-Day was so hard to, to orchestrate. And they had to use all kinds of secrets and lies. And only a couple of people knew the full story from the beginning. Because it's hard to keep something secret the more people know about it. So how many people need to know if just one autonomous nuke torpedo is going to be set off? And I'm not saying that's what they're going to do. I'm just giving it as a concrete example of what they could do. The Chinese, they also have advanced technology over us. This is something most Americans don't know. Their hypersonic missiles, our, our defense systems can't touch them. And we don't have anything like it. So we're definitely past the point of a set of nations, you know, traditionally us in the USSR, having a set of intercontinental ballistic missiles, and they're roughly equal in capability. And so it balances out and we have mutually assured destruction and no one's going to launch the attack because the other party would definitely, uh, both parties would definitely be destroyed. The Chinese hypersonic missiles, one of these missiles can take out any Navy ship. Effectively, their missiles render our Navy useless. The only exception there is the nuclear subs. So now you go down from having to defeat the entire Navy to having to deal with, I can't remember how many nuclear subs we have. I think it's something like 11, but I really don't remember. It's not that many. So if you're China, the challenge becomes, how do I bribe or otherwise disable those 11 subs? So you might only have to compromise 11 people, the captains of those ships, or someone on them, which is even easier. Although it's hard to get someone on a sub, I'd imagine, not like I've tried it, to sabotage the ship, because if it goes down, you do too. So that, that, that's probably a little tricky, but I'm sure those Chinese geniuses have something figured out. I mentioned diseases 
let me give you two more here. One, the fact that the Chinese are Chinese is a huge point of leverage. What do I mean by that? Well, it turns out that if you're, th there is a such thing as a genetic specific disease. The United States is a diverse nation. Theoretically, it would be easier to design a disease that only infected people who are not Chinese than it would to be uh, to design a disease that would not infect an American. And hopefully it makes sense as to why. Now, maybe it's taboo to talk about how different humans have different genetic makeup but it is a scientific fact. And it's one that the Chinese are absolutely leveraging in their R&D. I guarantee it. By the way, did you know that the Chinese own these um, companies that do the DNA tests? So they have a repository <laughs> of the DNA of all of these people that they want they have a reason to attack. The last point I'll make on that is one thing that I haven't seen any traffic on in mainstream news or sources is custom made diseases for food crops. So if you've ever driven across the United States, you'll notice all these signs that announce that the crops planted are specific varieties and they're genetically engineered crops to be Roundup Ready, for example. So you'll see Roundup Ready corn and soybeans. Those are the two that you'll see all over the place. This this idea is not too far from the, the one about human diseases. If you're trying to design something, it's much easier to design a virus, for example, any kind of disease, <clears throat> it could be bacterial, that acts on one species of plant than multiple species of plant. And difficulty aside, think about the value of the specificity. So I mentioned one of the reasons that the Chinese will invade the United States is because they need more resources. They have access to global resources, but the United States has more and more fertile farmland than any other country in the world. We are exceptionally equipped to grow food. It's one of the main reasons our nation has enjoyed the prosperity that it has. If you wanted to cause some sort of famine to soften up the United States, which would be a very good way of doing it, you'd probably want to take out Roundup Ready corn and or Roundup Ready soybeans. <clears throat> because if that crop died in the middle of the season, before harvest, but late enough that nothing could be replanted, or whenever it died, if you managed to introduce a disease that prevents it from growing, you would completely destroy the food supply because that's a massive percentage supply of our calories even uh, either directly or as animal feed. And it would cause tremendous, tremendous explosion of food prices and food shortages and starvation. A lot of people would die from it and a lot of people would be in a really bad way. But if you did it like that, you wouldn't have to worry about the downstream effects on the farmland because all it would do is prevent you from growing those two crops. Interesting, huh? And so, if I had to make a prediction about how this is going to go down, I'd say what we could expect is more 
quantity and intensity of plausibly deniable effects, actions from the Chinese. <clears throat> and I would expect them to fall into the patterns we've discussed in this video. But they might have something else that's clever up their sleeve. What I would not expect is for any overt attack from China on the United States to occur without a lot more hardship and death occurring before it from these, these activities. So, <clears throat> with that in mind, what should you do about it? What's the point? So maybe I've persuaded you. Maybe some of these ideas are valid. Maybe some of them aren't. Maybe I've missed a whole bunch. But if there's some nugget of this that resonates with you, that seems plausible, that seems believable, the question is, what should you do about it? I think the best way of thinking about this is imagine a bunch of people standing around and someone's cutting down a very large tree. Now, in reality, if this were to happen, you'd want to know where the tree is going to fall so you can move out of the way and it won't hit you. With this situation, if you live in the United States, the tree is going to hit you and there's nothing you can do to not get hit by it. And so if you know that you're about to get hit by something, probably the only thing you can do is try to get stronger so that when it does hit you, it doesn't hurt you as badly. Now, it might seem ridiculous to make the argument that there's something you can do to somehow be in a better place when something so terrible as a foreign, a successful foreign invasion occurs. But I disagree. Because what's on the inside of us is much more important than what's going on outside of us. One of the downsides of living in a prosperous nation is that we're given pretty much every reason in the world to be soft, weak, and probably pretty unhappy people when it comes down to it. The cause of this and why it's so hard to see, it's linked to this prosperity. When you take away that situation and you put that kind of person in a different situation, it becomes very evident, but it's also too late to do much to change. So now is the time to become a better person, to, to spend the time doing the things that you truly believe are important for yourself and for those around you. And I believe very deeply in Jesus Christ. And I, I know that there are a lot of people out there who call themselves Christians and do things that are easy to find fault with if you're not in that. And I see where people who have that position are coming from. And I share a lot of their same ideas about it. My take on Jesus is very different because I have found that when you are actually an honest person and you actually live the things that he taught, it changes you and it changes the way that you feel about yourself and others and the things that you do with your time. And more than anything else, it changes the meaning that you have in life. If you have a strong enough meaning, you can, in fact, endure very terrible things. And you also have a strong reason for why you'd ever want to. It turns out that the reason we're here, it's not just to preserve our own lives. It's to make ourselves better people and to do what we can to help others find more joy. And I have found that that's, that's a set of ideas that you can put your weight into and it will carry you through any level of difficulty in life. And so if you think that any of these things might happen, I think and I hope that, that 
you will use it as motivation to do more, to think about who you are and who you'd like to be, and to take steps to become more like that person. I sincerely believe that the things that are coming in the relatively near future will be harder than most people can imagine, let alone what they've lived through before. And so I, I strongly encourage you to take this seriously, to do your own research, but more than anything else, to spend time seriously working on yourself and orienting your life to the benefit of other people. The good news is, even if I'm 100% wrong about all of this, if you find a way to make yourself a better person and spend more of your effort on the happiness of others, it will pay dividends, no matter what happens.